like to turn, turn with me this morning to Jonah. Jonah chapter 4. Um, if you find a if you find Amos, it's a bit of a bigger book. Then you've got Obadiah, and then jo- Jonah's immediately after Obadiah. Four chapters of Jonah. <coughs> Four chapters. We're in the final chapter this morning. Just coming to the end of our kind of mini mini series in Jonah. Really, um, I'm going to read from. I'll just read the. I'll read verse ten of chapter three. Uh, through to the end of the of the book. <clears throat> and then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, And there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on a plant for which you have not laboured, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their their left, and much livestock? Let's just pray, shall we? Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would just um, help me now as I bring this word to to our hearts and our ears, Lord. I pray that you would anoint me lord grant me unction from on high and clarity of thought and speech lord be honored and 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 glorified uh, as we consider your word this morning we pray in jesus name amen so general uh, it's been a couple of weeks hasn't it since we uh, were in jonah but just a general recap really chapter one we see jonah being called as a prophet uh, to the people of nineveh to the people of nineveh um uh, their wickedness had cried out to God, and God calls Jonah to go and to preach this message to them. And as we've uh, expressed just a few weeks ago, he made a beeline in the complete opposite direction for Tarshish, which was the end of the known world at that point, the kind of um, western uh, region of the Mediterranean. Uh, and God sends this uh, great storm and this great fish, uh, which was appointed by God. And then we know in chapter 2 that uh, from the belly of the whale we see this prayer of thanksgiving that Jonah gives to God, humbling himself uh, under the sovereign hand of God, turning his face back to God and recognising his guilt and what he had done. Then we see chapter 3, Jonah really being reinstated. He's vomited up by the, by the, the fish, the whale, onto dry land. He makes his way to Nineveh. He begins to preach this very simple but profound message that God had given him 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people of Nineveh repent, and we see even the king of Nineveh kind of calling for a national fast uh, before God. They turn from their, their ways, and as we just read today, really the last 
uh, verse in chapter 3, God see, saw their works, how they turned from doing evil, and he relented from this disaster that he said he was going to bring upon them, uh, so much so that he did not, he did not do it. And we come now really to the final chapter of Jonah, and we see another interaction between Jonah and the Lord. Uh, another, another prayer really, but this prayer seemingly lacking the humility uh, of the first prayer that we see in chapter 2 when Jonah was in the belly of the whale. We see Jonah's reaction um, in God relenting from, destructing, uh, from destroying the Ninevites. We see his reaction. Um, we see uh, in this chapter here this vast contrast between God's great mercy and his kindness, the kindness and the mercy of this God, and the anger of this prophet who, who himself, even just a few days earlier, was recognizing God's mercy and thanking him for his kindness. And now here he is uh, um, in his own personal disobedience, in a sense, and being angry with God. It's the first time in the book of Jonah that we really see the reason why Jonah fled in the first place. Up until this point, we don't, it kind of, it's kind of open for speculation, it's open for interpretation. Why did jo Jonah go to, to Tarshish? But we see here in the first few verses of chapter 4, um, the dialogue that, that Jonah brings to, to God. He said, uh, isn't this not the reason why I, why I fled to Tarshish, for I know that you're grace, gracious and merciful. So he, he avoided his mission because he didn't want God to be merciful. He didn't want God to show mercy. He knew God was going to be merciful. He knew, he had faith that God was going to relent from destroying these people. So Jonah left for Tarshish. In some ways, the book of Jonah and this chapter here, it kind of leaves the reader hanging in relation to the outcome of the prophet. It's kind of a bit of a cliffhanger in a sense to, at, the end of the, at the end of the chapter here. It doesn't really resolve uh, how, how Jonah goes on to live or what, what you know, the, re the, the relationship that he, that he has continuing on with the Lord uh, in his life. <clears throat> we see here his perspective on the Ninevites. It's a book that we can learn much from, although it leaves the reader hanging in some ways. It's a chapter as well, chapter 4, we can learn much from concerning our own walk. It raises questions in our own lives as Christians, questions that concerning the faithful call of the Christian to obey God in our own lives with whatever he calls us to do. How do we view and consider the graciousness of God and the loving kindness of God in a world that we live in today? How do we view others around us, fellow man that are in rebellion towards God? How do we, do we have areas of prejudice or areas of, of uh, anger in our own hearts towards others around us that may have wronged us in the past? But I think Jonah really brings some greater considerations for us concerning the motivation of the Christian life. Why should we feel joy over sinners that repent? We've been praying for people this morning to come to the Lord. Why should we feel joy over that? Why do we feel joy over that? Why do we maybe sometimes seem a bit unconcerned about people uh, turning from sin and turning to Christ? Do we, lack a, 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 do we often lack a zeal as Christians for the glory of God in the salvation of souls? Are we living for the glory of God in all that we, in all that we do? So I've got really two points this morning, and, uh, and some sub-points within the two points. Firstly, the, the first point, the pride of the prophet. The pride of the prophet. And then secondly, uh, we look at the, the goodness and the mercy of the king. So the pride of the prophet, right from the, the outset of the book of Jonah, um, <clears throat> we see a difference with Jonah as a prophet. He's one of the minor prophets in scripture, but his life, in a sense, is not given to us. Often with the prophets, you see them living exemplary lives. They're living lives of obedience, and we can glean from these people with regards to their obedience. But Jonah's life really, in many ways, uh, offers us an example of how we shouldn't live. It offers us an example of things that we shouldn't do. We can almost take, a, take the negative and learn from it as Christians. Um, no doubt when he was um, vomited up by the, the whale, there was a certain uh, process of obedience. He went and he preached. But in the most part, um, Jonah uh, was, uh, is like a negative example for us. He's called by God and he runs then we see him turn back to the, 
to the task that he was given by God under the sovereign hand of God. But now here in chapter 4, again, he's kind of at loggerheads with God. He's, he's questioning God. He's, he's opposing the will of God. Matthew Henry, uh, the um, uh, theologian, writes these words. He says, Jonah, initially we see him flying from the face of God, but now here in chapter 4 we see him flying in the face of God. So he's flying from the commission that God's called him to, and now here he's literally flying within the face of God. He preached this message, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The people repented and God relented, of his judgment upon the people. And this made Jonah angry. Strange, isn't it? His heart was filled with rage. Uh, again, Matthew Henry writes, it's a strange source of man uh, to, to dread the success of his ministry. 120,000 people coming to God and turning from their sin, and yet he's angry, he's, dis he's displeased by that. Imagine that, imagine a revival in uh, Worcester or the Wire Forest, 100,000 people in each of those areas and coming to the Lord and whoever was involved to be used as an instrument of God's grace in that being angry and being uh, displeased with God moving in such a way. It's a strange affliction that we see here within Jonah. <clears throat> he makes it very clear, verse 2 of our text today, chapter 4, that it was God's mercy, his forgiveness and his goodness that was the source of his disappointment. But why? Why would you be disappointed with that? Well, there's several potential different views. I'll just share a couple. Um, in many ways, we can't underestimate the, the disdain that God's people had for the Assyrians uh, in that time, in that culture, uh, particularly the, the evils of the Ninevites. It was a very brutal culture. I've shared this in weeks gone by, some of the things that they did to their enemies, to those who opposed their, the reign of the king there, those who opposed them. Uh, their their um, enemy forces were often taken and dismembered and, and uh, very cruelly treated. They were a, bar, a barbaric people. Maybe the equivalent to, uh, again, I, don't, I, you know, I know this is a bit of a, not a great example, but maybe the equivalent to like an, ICE, an ISIS group or some Islamic fundamentalist coming and, and taking your relatives and, and, and doing all kinds of atrocities to them in the culture that, you're, that you live in within ourselves. It would be seen as a, they were a very brutal, very wicked uh, culture. The destruction of Nineveh, God destroying this people and wiping them off the face of the planet would have been seen as a victory in a sense for Israel. The enemies of God <coughs> being dealt with uh, righteously and justly by God in, in their destruction. Maybe Jonah wanted to see Nineveh's downfall to satisfy his own sense of justice uh, concerning the wickedness of this people. Uh, there is another view, but perhaps more unlikely, um, that Jonah preached this message of ju judgment and God relented, so therefore he was annoyed, he was frustrated, because it almost felt like his words uh, were empty words, they were illegitimate uh, to the audience that he was speaking with. But, uh, but we know, I, I think I lean more towards the first point really, that, that this nation of Nineveh, uh, the, of, of Assyria, the enemies of God in this city of Nineveh, were certainly, um, uh, would have been considered a victory for God's people had God decided to destroy this people. We don't really know for sure, but we know that he was angry. We know that he was prideful. And I want to speak just for a moment about the, the, pr the pride of the prophet. And this was really the root here of this issue. And in many ways, Pride is the root of all of our issues when it comes to the sin in our lives. The sin that we have, that we manifest in various ways, the things that we do that are wrong, are really rooted in a heart of pride, in areas of pride in our lives. It's uh, the original sin, if I could put it like that. It was the sin that caused Satan himself to fall. We think of um, Isaiah 14. Uh, speaks of Lucifer, the son of the morning, how you're cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That was the, that was the MO of, of Satan, that was his modus operandi, that he was going to exalt himself above God, exalt his throne above the stars of God. It was the original sin, 
of Satan. It was what caused the fall of Adam and Eve. And it really, it's the, it's the root of the issue for every human being that lives today on planet Earth. It's an abomination before God. Pride is something that God doesn't, he doesn't treat that indifferently. He's not, he's not casual about it. He hates, God hates pride. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 18, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven, yes, seven are an abomination to him. And here's the first thing in the list, a proud look. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, and a false witness who spreads lies and sows discord among brethren. But we see there a proud look being on the top of the list of things that God hates. It's an abomination to him. God resists the prideful. He resists the proud. 1 Peter 5, verse 5 says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that's what, the, that's what happens when we, when we have pride in our lives. We become resistant, in a sense. God begins to resist us. We don't walk in step with him, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But it's, uh, it's resisted by God, and ultimately the end of, pri- the end of a proud life is destruction. Proverbs 16, 18 and 19. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. Now there's a difference when we talk about pride. Obviously we can, we can take pride in things. You know, we have maybe our children uh, achieve a particular accomplishment. They, they, they win a, a competition or something. We know we have pride in our children. We can take pride in one another. The gifting that the Lord has given us as a church, each one of us being given different gifts by God to, to edify the body and to glorify Christ in service as we come together, we meet in fellowship. You know, we can, uh, like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7 uh, to the church at Corinth, I am acting with great boldness towards you. I have great pride in you, he says. I am filled with comfort in all affliction. I am overflowing with joy. So we can have pride in one another. We, this isn't the pride that we're talking about when we're talking about sinful pride. <clears throat> the pride that is sinful often can manifest itself in, in one of various ways uh, within our hearts. We see it here with our, within our text today, uh, Jonah and his ministry of what he was called to do. Firstly, this pride brought him into conflict with God. It, brought him, it, it made him out of step with God's plans. You know, one of the reasons why, I mean, it is the reason why people don't give their lives to Christ. is because they have a, a root of pride within them. They want to be their own God. They don't want to get off the throne of their own lives and, and place Christ on the throne, if I could put it like that, or see Christ as being on the throne of their lives. It's the number one reason why men and women do not come to Christ is because of their pride. It has them enslaved and ensnared. But you know, even, even when you become a Christian, pride doesn't completely go away. You don't get saved and then pride you know, completely disappears. We can, even Christians can often operate pridefully. Pride can creep it can creep back in in various ways. The enemy, the enemy has a, an amazing, he's a schemer and he's a deceiver and he has an amazing way of massaging your pride, of, of kind of just bringing it back in. Often when you see, when people get saved, there's a real brokenness and a humbling that goes on there. But you know, it's not long until the Lord, uh, uh, until um, w- when walking with the Lord, the enemy can really put temptations in your way and start to caress the pride that kind of lies within the flesh, even as, even as Christians. We're often the last ones to spot pride in our own lives. We often see it in other people, don't we? But it's very rarely do we see it in our own lives. And anybody who thinks that they're not proud is probably needing to have a good look in the mirror concerning the pride that is in our lives and that we need to have dealt with. And it's something that will be with us, yes, to varying degrees, but it's something that will be with us until, until we reach heaven itself. It's something that we need to wage war against on a, on a daily basis. Uh, Spurgeon uh, says these words, he said, the demon of pride was born with us and it, and it will not die one hour before us. The demon of pride was born with us and it will not die one hour before us. It's something that we need to be aware of every day. How are we going to put this pride to death today? 
How are we going to take, how are we going to step down off the throne of trying to control our own lives? And how are we going to uh, yield to the will of God and, and have him at the center of all that we do today? It causes us to walk out of step with God's will for our lives. Jonah, Jonah was certainly um, <clears throat> walking out of step of God's will, or at least with regards to the heart of God for the people of Nineveh. At first, he was running from God, and now we see in chapter 4, we even get this sense of him coming into direct conflict with God's plans for the Ninevites. God wanted to save these people, and he saved these people, and it made Jonah angry. He was walking out of step with God. Verse 1, it says, but it, it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly that God, had say, that God had relented from the destruction of these people. The word here, displeased, comes from a, the Hebrew word ra, which literally means evil. It was ex- so the interpretation there is, this, it, jo- it was an exceeding evil for Jonah. So Jonah saw God's mercy as an evil thing. I mean, what, a, what an amazing... You know, or to have such a distorted perspective like that. He was angry with God. He was angry with the situation. He was angry for being involved. But even more deeply than that, he considered it to be an evil, effectively calling what God had done evil. Now, you know what the Bible says about that position when someone falls into that position. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Woe to those. Woe, that woe there is a divine judgment. Woe unto those who call good evil and evil good, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And that's what Jonah was effectively doing here. He was calling what was good evil. And uh, a very dangerous place to be. And it shows us really just how out of step Jonah's pride had put him in regards to the will of God uh, with, in his own life and the life of the Ninevites. But it also shows us it's a lesson for us about the dangers of our pride in our own lives and how it can really knock us out of sync with God's will for our lives. Uh, Pride can also blind us uh, to the reality, uh, to to realities around us. It stops Jonah from seeing correctly, from seeing his own self correctly. He somehow maybe thought that he was superior, that somehow he deserved the mercy of God just a few chapters earlier in the belly of the whale. Maybe he deserved God's grace and God's goodness towards him, but not these people. He started to have a a blinding concerning what was really going on. It caused him to take a self-centered approach, not a God-centered approach. And that's really what pride does. It puts our self at the center. It causes us to, uh, to not see correctly. And this is the reason why we walk out of step with God when we have pride manifesting itself. It's because it blinds us to the truth. You know, you can read, a, we hear people say, oh, you know, all the time you hear people say, oh, I've read the Bible, didn't see anything, didn't mean anything to me. It's because we, they have pride that's blinding them to the truth. When we read the Bible, we need to pray beforehand, Lord, keep me, let me read this in a humble way today. Let me read this in a way where where I'm going to hear you speak to my heart. And if there's things within me that needs to change, show me. Allow me to hear those things inwardly that I may fall in line with your will, that we may see ourselves correctly in light of God. And we see examples of this spiritual pride in the Scriptures. Don't we remember Jesus when he was talking about the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector and they went up to the temple to pray? And the, uh, the, tax, the, the Pharisee, he, he stood and prayed. He said, God, I thank you that I'm, that I'm not like other men. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not or even like this tax collector here who's praying with me. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. You know, he's there and he's full of pride. He's praying, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like these people. And thank you that I'm not like those people. He couldn't see himself rightly. But then it says the tax collector standing afar off, he would not so much as even raise his his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. 
And Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, the world, the world tells us, doesn't it, you've got to put yourself at the top. Have you heard the expression, dog eat dog? It's a dog eat dog world. You've got to, you've got to go, for, go for what you can go for and get what you can out of this life. And it doesn't matter who you trample on to get there. That's the way the world, the world works, isn't it? I mean, here's the strap line of the, of, of, of the enemy, the strap line of Satan. Do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. Go and get what you want to get and make the most of this life because this is all you've got. That's what the enemy will tell you. But God tells us the complete opposite. It's not what we want to do. It's what, what, it, what is his will. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Not, not our will, but God's will be done. And we know there's a, an eternity to come. We're not living for the next couple of decades. We're not living for the next few years. We're living in light of eternity. We're living in light of... You know, I, I, I prayed earlier on about the, the, the text in the Psalms about teaching us to number our, our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. There's something to be said for keeping an eternal perspective in, in the forefront of your mind when you're living life, when you're going through just day-to-day -day work. We're dealing with people on the phone, how we're working in our families, how we, what we feel the Lord's calling us to do throughout the week. Let's keep our minds on eternity, on the reality that we're living, storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven, not here on earth. Jonah was showing this pride. If there was ever an expression of spiritual pride, pr pridefulness, it was here with Jonah. He was not seeing as he should have seen. He wasn't considering his fellow human beings the image bearers of God as he should have done. He wasn't seeing the nature of God as he should have done. And ultimately, he wasn't seeing himself as he should have done. I wonder, do we see those around us? Do we have, any, do we have a personal bias you know, towards people? You know, sometimes it creeps in, doesn't it? You think, how can, God, how can God save a person like that? They're so far gone. Or, you know, these, things, these thoughts can creep in. And we must be very careful to realize that we have others around us that need to hear the gospel. There's... There's no one who's too far gone for God. Devil worshippers, people who are involved in the occult, people who have said that they've sold their soul to Satan, or, you know, these, these men and women, they need Christ. They haven't gone so far that they, can be, that, 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 they, that they can't be forgiven. God can forgive all those who would come to him in humility. Another manifestation of pride. We see anger take place it says that Jonah was displeased it, this, it displeased Jonah exceedingly verse 1 and he became angry this is how far Jonah's pride had blinded, blinded him and it exposes really the depths and the root and the power of pride this prophet had really become hardened so, so hardened that he was angry with God and, all, and of all things angry with God for saving and granting repentance to sinner. Jonah even went out to the, the east side of the city and uh, there was this, um, God sent this ver vermin east wind sent by God causing the sun to beat down upon his head scorching him from the outside whilst always inwardly also having this burning anger towards what God had done and towards the people of Nineveh. A burning anger that, that filled his heart and a physical heat to match. Jonah sat and waited to see if the city indeed would still perhaps be destroyed by God. He wasn't sitting out on that hill just kind of passing the time. He wanted that city to be destroyed. Such was the anger in his own heart. Anger towards God and anger, anger towards this people of Nineveh. He felt such disdain towards them. God asked him that question in verses 4 and verse 9. Is it right for you to be angry? Now we know that anger is a, an emotion that, that men and women feel. There's such thing as righteous anger. Not all anger is sin. 
There is righteous anger. Remember Jesus in Mark 3 when he, he healed the man in, on the Sabbath with the withered hand and they were trying to catch him out. Is it lawful to do good or evil on the Sabbath to save or to kill? And he says he looked around, Jesus, he looked around at them with anger, being grieved at the hardness of their hearts. Remember Jesus driving out the money lenders in the temple? They were exchange, the exchange rates were extortionate. And he said, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. And on one occasion, he made a cord of whips and he drove them out. You know, he would have expressed anger. He wasn't doing that with a big smile on his face, trying, you know, trying to just like get along with everybody. There was a sense in which there was a, a righteous indignation. In Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul says, be angry and do not sin. To be angry over the things which God is angry about is not actually sinful. It's actually, there's actually a faithfulness about that. There's certain things that God is angry about. You know, if we're indifferent to some of the sins that are going on in this world, you know, you consider the sin of abortion and the sin of um, whatever it may be, all kinds of different evils that are taking place. God is angry at these things. He's not indifferent. And we say, oh, well, God, an angry God, maybe that's the Old Testament. Surely that's the Old Testament. We know Psalm 7, it says, God is a just judge and God is angry with the wicked every day. He's, he's angry every day, according to his word. Every day he's angry with sinners. And that text means what it says. There's no getting around it. There's no trying to wiggle our way out of it. Now, we need to take it in his context. We need to also recognize that God's, God's anger is not like our anger. It's not tainted with sin and pridefulness and selfishness. His anger is perfectly holy and righteous and good and perfectly just. But there are things that we can be angry about as Christians in a righteous way and indignant about. You could argue even maybe Jonah had some right to be indignant about the way the Ninevites treated people of their day, how, he, how they treated the people within their city. In, in Jonah 1.1 1, 1, it talks about how the wickedness of Nineveh came up to God. They were clearly a very wicked people. He maybe had some grounds to be angry, but that's not the type of anger that we're seeing expressed here in Jonah's uh, in, in chapter 4, we see a prideful anger. Jonah was angry because of the compassion that God had shown and extended to them. This anger was rooted in a self-righteousness. It was a sinful anger that didn't have God's glory in mind or for consideration. And it was an anger which was displeasing to God. An anger that gravitated against the will of God. The Lord made this very clear by asking Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? And anger is often a manifestation of pride. You know, often pride and anger and fear often work together because when, if a person has a, a, a deep-rooted pride, they want to be in control of situations, they want to take control, and when they're out of control, they get fearful, and when a person is fearful, they often man that often manifests with anger. And you see this angriness you know Jonah wanted he wanted what he wanted he wanted these Ninevites to be destroyed and that was taken out of his control it was taken out of his hands God had other plans and Jonah was angry the manifestation of that pride manifested itself in anger we must be very careful you know folks to keep our anger in check if there may be times where we struggle with pride and control we want to control the situation we want to do things a certain way and it's not going the way we want it to go. And that can get frustrations and anger that can explode. You know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7 that the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So you see the, the connection here of pride again. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry for anger rests in the bosom of a fool. Anger rests in the bosom of a fool. The Bible literally says if you have anger resting, you know, it's just there waiting to explode. It's waiting to be lit and to come out again. The Bible says that whoever has that is a fool in the eyes of God. It's a foolish thing. And I guess I wasn't really preparing to share this, but you know, the only way to treat that anger, the only way to get that anger dealt with is to come to Christ really and to see to see uh, the price that was paid at Calvary, 
to look to the Lord, to recognize that he is on the throne, to submit your life to his sovereign purposes and his sovereign plans. Jonah, that's what Jonah should have done. He should have said, Lord, I'm struggling with this, but I know that you are sovereign. I know that you are good. And I submit my life. I submit my, my thoughts to you. I submit my life to you. Use me and, and do what you were, would have to be done, Lord. And, tr and truly yield his life to the plans of God, knowing that God is sovereign. Pride also just brings, the, just finally on this first, this first point, and then we'll look at our final point. Um, pride brings despair. It brings despair. He became angry and he prayed. Well, at least, at least he prayed. But unlike earlier, he prayed with a wrong... His, his heart attitude was wrong. Earlier on, Jonah was praying from the belly of the whale. In chapter 2, you don't have to necessarily turn there, but he, he said to God, he said, You've brought my life up from the pit. O Lord, my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. So he's saying here, Lord, you brought my life up from the pit. I was drowning in the ocean and you saved me. When my soul was fainting within me, I re he remembered the Lord. He, he, his prayer basically centered around a humility. From the tribulation of the whale's belly, Jonah's perspective was seemingly a mu much more humble one. Even perhaps arguably more hopeful. He was in a dire situation. And he just handed himself over to the Lord's mercy, thanking him for rescuing his soul when it was fainting, bringing his life up from the pit. You know, when we go through affl afflictions, the Lord puts us through afflictions in order to teach us how to pray submissively, in order to teach us how to pray with, in, a, in a humble manner which is pleasing to God. In order to, in order, sometimes we get to points where we've got nowhere to go other than to thrust ourselves upon the mercy of God. And God specifically puts us in those places to break our pride from us. That's what God does in the lives of Christians. And that's a good thing. He disciplines those that he loves. Now, if he lets you just wander off into, the, into deeper and deeper recesses of pride for, the, for your years and years and years to come, that is a dangerous place to be because God is not disciplining you. He's not chastening you and therefore showing you that you're an illegitimate child, not, one, not truly one of his. But it's a good thing if we're being brought through trials. We're being refined in the fire like precious metal, being placed into the heat to burn off the dross. That's what God does with us. He places, into, places us into the heat of trials to burn off the dross of pride and sin in our lives. But this pride that Jonah was feeling was bringing desperation. He even says in verse 3, Oh Lord, take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. In verse 8, he wished death for himself and said it's better for me to die than to live. Jonah here despairing even of life itself. And again, this is one of the manifestations of a, of a, a prideful attitude, walking out of sync with the Lord, uh, co uh, in conflict with God uh, through an angry manifestation of pride it brings despair it brings melancholy it brings, the, some, it brings that feeling of there's just something not right I'm not walking as I should be something not right today now we must be very careful there's, there's no doubt there's physiological issues it, there's many people in this world today that struggle with deep depression melancholy physiological things that are going on in their, in their body which are causing them to, to, to have not just a sadness but something more darker, more deeper than that. But what I'm talking about here is, a, is, a, a, is a, an, out of, an out of step walk, if I could put it like that, a walk which is out of step with God, which brings a despair to the lives of those who are walking in pride. It takes away that soundness of mind. We start to become turmoiled in our minds. We know something's not right. We know that we're at odds with God and his will for our lives. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And as we draw near to him, as we humble ourselves in the sight of the cross, we'll begin to have more, more of that clear thinking more of that soundness 
in our own minds. Yes, we may struggle. I mean, you look at Spurgeon himself, the Prince of Preachers. This man, he struggled with chronic depression all his life. He would, he would struggle with really dark seasons. But, you know, he had a, a mind that was sound because he had a mind that was stayed on Christ. His mind was kept on him. He knew that God was, in, was on the throne, that God was in charge. We as Christians can have, can have joy. We haven't got to be crying out, Lord, take our lives from us. It's better for us to die, Lord. But we can have joy inexpressible. Christians should be the most joyful people on the face of the planet Earth. The most joyful people in the world. Knowing that we have eternity to come with our Creator. Knowing that we, as we go through this momentary light affliction in this world, it's, not, it's nothing to be compared to the eternal weight of glory that can be found in the presence of God. We read from Psalm 16. This is where joy is found in God's presence. In your presence is fullness of joy. Psalm 16, 11. So it's in the presence of God as we walk with Him, as we walk in His will, that joy, true joy is found. Paul says in Philippians, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say to you, rejoice. That's where true rejoicing is found. It's when it's in the Lord. You'll never find true contentment in the things of this world. You'll never find true joy in the things of this world. Now don't get me wrong. Are there things that God has given us? He's given us one, and one another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, a family, a fellowship of Christians. He's given us our own families, children and natural families. He's given us health in our bodies. He's given us every good and perfect gift comes from him. But if, we find, if we're trying to find our fulfillment in the gift rather than in the giver, then we'll never truly find the joy that God has to give us. It's in his presence is the fullness of joy. In his presence. Rejoice in the Lord always. So it's in the Lord where we can truly rejoice. I've spoken about the pride of the prophet. Just uh, as we consider our final point now the goodness and the mercy of the king the goodness and the mercy of the king what a merciful God when you look at, when you look at Jonah 4 what a merciful and good God we have this is the same God that we serve the God who is who, he, his mercy and his goodness is sovereign now we spoke about God's sovereign grace a few weeks ago didn't we but just to touch on this a little bit here he worked sovereignly through Jonah. Now, apart from arguably Jonah's prayer of thankfulness in Jonah 2, and Jonah willingly being, well, I say willingly, vomited out by the, the fish and, and going to Nineveh and preaching, arguably the rest of his ministry was one of Jonah getting it wrong and just kicking and screaming all the way along and going left when he should have gone right, literally. But isn't it amazing how God's, God still sovereignly worked through Jonah. Even in his disobedience, God worked through him. And, he, and, and there's an old expression, God taking a bent stick and striking a straight blow. Jonah was, he was that bent stick, of, uh, so to speak. But God used him to preach the message and to, and to see repentance rendered in the hearts of the Ninevites. This shows us that God is the God who's going to accomplish his purposes, in his time and in his way. Do you remember when it said that he prepared the fish back in chapter 1? That God prepared, and the word there is that it's appointed. Here's this fish that God had brought into creation. At one point this fish was just born, and this fish had been appointed by God to grow and to swallow Jonah and to take him and to vomit him back up. This is the sovereign hand of God. God has appointed these things. But then we have this strange section in our, in our text today, don't we, about this plant and this worm. This plant that God had prepared to grow up over Jonah's head overnight and this worm to, to eat the plant, sorry, overnight and then the, uh, the vehement, vehement wind to come which had been prepared. And you see this word again, prepared. God prepared the plant. He prepared the worm, verse 7, to eat the plant. Then he prepared the wind to cause the sun to beat down on Jonah. And you see this word again, he appointed it. 
God appointed it, he appointed it. And God was sovereignly working, even in this strange segment of this illustration here that God brings to Jonah, showing his goodness and his mercy, and that he is the one who is sovereign over all his creatures. He's the one who will do what he has purposed to do. He's the one who chooses people from eternity past. Do you know that if you're a Christian in here today, you've been chosen by God, and he chose you before you were even born. He chose you before the angels were even made. He chose you from eternity past, from the foundation of the world. It says in Ephesians 1, 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That is, a, that is an amazing reality when you think of God's sovereign mercy and his sovereign grace. He didn't come, he didn't come down in Kidderminster 15 years ago and, and be like, oh well, you know, Pete's he's, he's turning over a new leaf so he can, be in, he can be in my kingdom, he can be in my church, or you know, Nick, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a nice guy so he can be in, in, in the church. That's not how it works. God, God chose us before we were even born, before we were even conceived in our mother's wombs. Because his mercy is sovereign. His goodness is sovereign. His goodness and mercy are not only sovereign, but they're long-suffering. They're long-suffering. In verse 6, he prepared this plant to, yes, give a sovereign illustration, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But he prepared this plant to come over Jonah, it says in verse 6, to put him out of his misery. Jonah, the, the heat was, was beating down upon Jonah, and God put him out of his misery. This was a genuine act of mercy being extended by the God who was literally being sinned against by the prophet. This prophet was angry with God. He said, what God has done is, is evil. He's saying, is it, is it, he's ungrateful. He's saying, just take my life from me. It's over, it's finished. And God prepared a plant to put him out of his misery, to give him, sh to give him shade in the heat of the day. He didn't have to do this. God didn't have to do that for Jonah. He didn't have to save Jonah from the, in the belly of the whale. He didn't have to um, save the Ninevites. But God is merciful. He's long-suffering. What a gracious God that we serve. How often we provoke God with our sin. And yet God, time after time, is merciful. Time after time, God is gracious. He receives us back to himself. His, his mercies are, 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 are new every day. You know, Jonah had that right, didn't he? Look, look at this in verse 2, the end of verse 2. He fled to Tarshish, for I know that you are gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Jonah, Jonah did understand that about God. And do we understand that? Do we understand that God is a merciful God? Or do we just have this kind of harsh, taskmaster view of God, especially within reform circles, sometimes this hard God who's just waiting to trip everybody up, he's waiting to put you in your place and to put you straight. But you know, God is a merciful God, he's gracious. And his loving kindness extends for all who would come to him. On that note, he's, just to finish off now, last, last quick couple of points here. His mercy, and, his mercy and goodness is indiscriminate. What do I mean by that? Well, we've already touched on it a little bit. He doesn't choose to save good people. Scott, you prayed in your prayer this morning. You know, you save sinners. He came to save sinners. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And it's within that reality that his mercy is amplified. It's within his, the fact that he provides a, a leaf to cover Jonah after he's been so sinful that the mercy of God is amplified in that. These Ninevites, they deserve, they deserve judgment. They deserve being wiped off the face of the planet for their sin, just as we do. But it's in, it's in the, the backdrop of that evil and that sin where God's mercy is, is extended and amplified. It's like a trophy of grace. And that's, isn't that often the case when you read through the scriptures? 
It's often the least assuming, the, the, the unsuspecting people, the people that are, that are the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the sinners. They even said, look, he eats and drinks with sinners. He came to save sinners. And it's often the, the down and outs. It's the ones that society would write off. The least expected people to be Christians are often the ones who get saved by God. And it's because then they have no glory of themselves in that. All the glory goes to God when God does that work in the heart of the worst of the worst of the worst, it's so that he is the only one who can receive the glory for that. He's the only one who can receive glory. All mankind is under the condemnation of God outside of Christ. It doesn't matter how respectful a person is in the eyes of their culture. They could be working for the local council, doing all the charity work that their, their spare time can, can offer them. Every single person is under the condemnation of God outside of Christ. The Bible says that his wrath abides upon them, that they stand condemned already, and it's only when a person comes to Christ that that condemnation is removed, as the Bible tells us, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God is not a respecter of persons. Romans Chapter 2, verse 11, it says, For there is no partiality with God. God will not... Here's the thing. A sweet elderly lady down the road, God will not think twice about throwing a lady like that into hell for her her sin. Now, she may be seen in the eyes of the community as a respectful person, as a good, a a do-gooder, but the Bible says if she's not in Christ, if she hasn't been born again, then she's an object of wrath, of divine judgment. And she would be just as guilty as the Ninevites, just as guilty as any others, just as guilty as we once were, just as guilty as any others that have been born under Adam, from the lineage of Adam. But also this indiscriminate salvation and mercy of God is also such a comfort knowing that there's nothing that someone, there's no, there's nothing that someone could do that is so far gone whereby they cannot be forgiven. There's, nothing that's, there's no situation that someone could be in that is so desperately evil that God cannot break through and save these people. I was talking about my, this guy, Dal, earlier. Some of, the, some of the state of these guys, bless them, you know, some of the states that they get into, there's no, no state that they get into would be so far gone that Christ cannot save. In fact, the only sin that is unforgivable is to deny Christ unto death. If someone does that and dies in that condition, then, it's, then, then that's it. But all of the sin can be forgiven by God. He's rich in mercy and great in love. The elderly person down the road needs the forgiveness of Christ as much as the serial killer on death row. They both need the, the, the mercies of Christ. And it's only the mercies of Christ that will save either one of them. Finally, his mercy is exposing and it's instructional. God dealt with Jonah here. And it's good to be dealt with by God. He disciplines those that he loves. He asks Jonah these searching questions. Is it right for you to be angry? And then later on, after he, after he gives him this illustration of the, of the plant and the wind, he asks him again, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? A series of questions here, which really just, are, just reveal what's going on in Jonah's heart. And it's good for us to, have, to ask questions of ourselves with regards to our motivations for why we do what we do, how we feel about certain, certain things in Scripture. It's good to, when you're reading the Word of God, even to ask yourself the question, how does that apply to me? How does that apply to me? Not in a, you know, not in a confrontational way, but a genuine way. How does does that apply to me? What questions can you ask of that text to your own heart? Because questions are very exposing, and the Lord is asking Jonah these questions. Is it right for you to be angry that I have relented from judgment of the Ninevites? And then he brings up this plant to cover him then he destroys the plant and he asks him the same question is it right for you to be angry but now he adds on the end of that about the plant 
showing the hypocrisy of Jonah's, of Jonah's um, you know, what he places value, most value in. He's more concerned about this plant, this, this, this thing that God has brought up and caused to grow from the, from the dust of the earth. He's more concerned about this plant that's uh, not an image bearer of God than he is about these 120,000 souls that are on their way to hell other than the forgiveness of God. His mercy is exposing and, in it, and it's instructional. Also here, in between the two questions, is it right for you to be angry, he brings this lesson to Jonah concerning this plant, concerning this worm, concerning this wind. Yes, it's expressing his sovereign mercy, but also just exposing his hypocrisy, his complete lack of love for, for fellow image bearers of God. And sometimes we need to be exposed, you know, the Lord brings us through trials. Sometimes the Lord causes a worm to eat the plants that are giving us shade sometimes, to expose where our heart's really at, to expose our motivations so we can get back in check, that we can get back in line with him. In the summary of this lesson that's been given, the Lord rebukes Jonah for his wrong attitude and his motives towards the Ninevites. He says these are an ignorant people. They don't know their right hand from their left. That's really, an, uh, that expression is like an, 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 an idiom, an idiom for those who are morally and spiritually unaware. Jonah here is supposed to be the, the representative from God's people, supposed to know God in that true way. He should have been aware of the character of God. He should have been aware of the nature of God's character. And God had to almost bring him through this trial in order to show him that God is not just the God of the Israelites, but is the God of all those who would repent, the God of all those who would come to him and to be saved by him. Do we know the mercies of this God? Are we... Are we comfortable when God brings instruction to our hearts and correction to our souls? Do we ask questions of, our, uh, of the Lord from the scriptures as we read through his word? Do we ask questions concerning our own walk with him? How we can grow in the knowledge of his grace? Do we, do we have a concern for those around us? For people who live in the world around us? Uh, who may be indifferent to their, their own sin and to the judgment of God? that is going to come to all men? And do we care enough to approach them, to share the, the good news with them, the good news of Jesus Christ? We have a God in heaven who's been gracious, merciful to us. So just some thoughts there from Jonah chapter 4. It leaves us kind of with questions in some way, the chapter. It leaves us hanging. It doesn't really answer the outcome with regards to how Jonah uh, then goes on to live, how then he goes on to view God's mercy and the Ninevites, but I think it's a book which we can learn a lot from, especially this chapter about our own motivations as Christians. Why do we do what we do? How do we view God's glory in light of the mission that he's called us to, in light of the places that he would have us to be throughout the day? Are we living for him to be glorified, or are we living for our own glory, and, and therefore our own, is our own pride manifesting itself in a sinful in sinful ways. I'd just encourage us, I guess, the point of application to finish. Let's be a people that, are broke, that, are, that have been broken at the foot of the cross. You know, in James it says, it says to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. That's where, that's where true humility is found. It's in the sight of the Lord. You can't, there's no one who's beholding the face of the bloody Saviour Jesus as he's hanging on that cross. There's no one beholding that that scene and walking around strutting their stuff as if they're the man because when you truly understand the sacrifice that's been paid when you get a greater glimpse of the price that was paid at Calvary as Christians we grow in our understanding of the price that was paid we grow in our knowledge of the sacrificial death of Christ as we as we get a greater glimpse of that it must humble us it must cause us to realize that we are not the center of the, this world. This world is not revolving around us, but it's revolving around the King, the one who 
died on the cross, was buried and rose again, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Let's, uh, let's pray, shall we? Let's pray.